Sunrise Church, we're so glad that you joined us online this Sunday. I just want to encourage you as we enter into worship, whatever your circumstances this morning, I just want you to let that go to God and just come to him with praise and with worship with, with all of your heart as we sing these two songs. all the earth. And great are you, Lord. 
more time we sing. the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, for you, sing holy. And holy, there is no none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around sing worthy song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever bring, we live for you, Jesus, Jesus the name above. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Sing holy. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those of us. Sing holy, singing holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside.
more time, sing holy. We're singing holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around. God, we thank you. We thank you for your presence today. We thank you that no matter our circumstances, God, that if we put our hope in you, if we put our trust in you, that you're always there for us, God, working on our behalf, wanting the best for us. And so today, God, we put our trust in you to lift your name high, to let your name be known in everything that we do with our lives, that it would always point back to you. It's in your name we pray, amen, amen. Well, good morning, good morning. We're so glad that you joined us here online for Sunday service. And now it's time to kick back, relax, grab your coffee, some breakfast, and get ready for a great Sunday message. Hey, Valley Rise Church, welcome to Sunday service. So glad that you chose to join us this morning. Hey, if I haven't got the chance to meet you or if you've never actually walked through the doors of Valley Rise Church, I just want to take a second and welcome you. My name is Pastor Christian Aranza and we started Valley Rise Church two and a half years ago in Tomball, Texas. We are standing in what is soon to be our brand new building. Be on the lookout. We're going to be posting information about when our first Sunday will be in here. I'm so excited. I can't even wait for you guys to see this place. It's going to be amazing. Because we're in our new building, last week I got a lot of texts that Pastor, you look like you were sweating. You were preaching hard. No, I'm, I may be preaching hard, but it is a thousand degrees in this warehouse building some days. And last week was worse. Hopefully I won't sweat as much today. But if you were looking at me last Sunday going, why does he keep wiping his face? It was because it was so hot in here. My mom called me after service. She goes, I love the message. It was phenomenal. Baby, why are you sweating so much? Are, are, do you, are you on a different medicine? Are you okay? Mom, it's 100 degrees in that building. So if you're wondering why I sweat or fix my hair, I don't want it to be distracting you. I just want you to know we're laboring for Jesus. <laughs> hey, let's pray and we're going to jump into this message. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the gift of spiritual family. Thank you for the gift of joining together, God, that while we may not be physically together in spirit, we are together. We know that your presence is so faithful to show up and meet us when we show up to spend time with you. Today, God, I ask that you would show up, that you would speak to our hearts and minds, that you would spend time with us, and that we would leave here different than we showed up. God, change us from the inside out. We want to get closer to you and closer to your people. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Hey, if this is your first Sunday with us, we're in the middle of a series called Hope on the Horizon. And we're talking this whole month about what it means to live a life of hope. What it means to be hopeful in times like we're in right now. Where there's job loss and sickness and people are dying and it's politically frustrated, frustrations and all kind of craziness. How in the midst of this do we have hope? To, 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 to trust Jesus? How do we have hope for something better? How do we have hope for a new job? Hope for a new relationship? Hope in the midst of trials, frustrations, illness, death, sickness, or quarantine? Hey, I want to encourage you today. There is a way to have hope in the midst of it. We've talked the last three weeks about what that looks like, and today I believe that God's going to give us another stepping stool to be able to jump up and grab that bar of hope so that we can all live the life that Jesus has for us Today I want to read you what Paul says in Ephesians. Now Paul in Ephesians begins to describe his desire for the church in Ephesus. And I want you to know, this is my desire for you. If you've been in this series going, Christian, what do you want us to get out of this hope series? Do you just want to encourage us because it's like so depressing right now and I'm stuck in my house? Partially, yes. But partially, I want you to have the same hope that Paul talks about in Ephesians. Let me read it to you, Ephesians 1, 18 through 20. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination. This is my prayer for you, church. This is, this is what I pray over you. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that he finds in us, his holy ones. Hey, time out. Let me just say this. If he finds it inside of you, 
That means there's greatness inside of you already. There is gold inside of each and every one of us. Sometimes it takes a little longer to find it. Sometimes there will be a bunch of junk on top of it. But there is gold inside of each and every one of us. God tells us his desire is that he would find it in us, his holy ones. Verse 19, I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Then your lives will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realm. Hey, wouldn't that be amazing if all of our lives met that description? If we could live a life that that was the description of it, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead was living in us, that when we walked on the earth, we could walk in the same power, the same miracle, the same relationships that Jesus did. Wouldn't that be amazing? I don't know about you, but I want that kind of life. I want that kind of life. But oftentimes, life is not that simple. It would be great if the enemy just stood back and said, listen, I'm not going to fight anymore. You can just do whatever you want to do. Walk in the fullness of who God created you to be. Wouldn't that be amazing if the devil let us do that? Well, the problem is the devil hates when we walk in the fullness that God created us to live in. And his desire is to short circuit every calling that God has on your life. I'm telling you today that the enemy is after the calling God has inside of you. But there is hope. And God has given us some amazing tools to use to battle the enemy, to fight the enemy, and to make sure that we finish the race well. Hey, that's what it's about. It's about finishing the race of life well. It's about standing before God one day and him saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't know about you, but I can't wait for the day I can stand before my heavenly father and hear those words. When I live a life full of purpose, full of hope, full of the spirit of God. Today, I want to talk to you about what stops us. I want to talk to you today about the enemies of hope. The enemies of hope. We've talked about the byproducts of hope. We've talked about the benefits of hope. We've talked about how to get hope. Today, I want to talk to you about what stops us from living that life. Because it's easy to have these things and begin this journey of hope until something, bam, smacks us and all of a sudden we go, how do I have hope in the midst of job loss? How do I have hope when someone I love just passed away? How do I have hope when I'm isolated and struggling with depression? How do I have hope when I don't know if I'm going to have a job when this thing ends? Hey, there are ways to battle the lies of the enemy and today we're going to discuss them. I want to talk to you out of a story today, one of the most famous stories in scripture, Mark 9, 17 through 27. Here's the story as Jesus tells it, as Mark tells it. A man spoke up out of the crowd. Teacher, he said, I have a son possessed by a demon that makes him mute. I brought him here to you, Jesus. Whenever the demon takes control of him, it knocks him down and he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and his body becomes stiff as a board. I brought him to your disciples, hoping they could deliver him, but they were not strong enough. Jesus said to the crowd, why are you such faithless people? How much longer must I remain with you and put up with your unbelief? Now bring the boy to me. So they brought him to Jesus and as soon as the demon saw him, it threw the boy into convulsions. He fell to the ground, rolling around and foaming at the mouth. Jesus turned to the father and asked him, How long has your son been tormented like this? Since childhood, he replied. It tries over and over to kill him by throwing him into the fire or water. But please, if you're able to do something, anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, What do you mean, if? If you are able to believe, all things are possible to the believer. When he heard this, the boy's father cried out with tears, saying, I do believe, Lord, help my little faith. Now, when Jesus saw that the crowd was quickly growing larger, he commanded the demon, saying, deaf and mute spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. The demon shrieked and threw the boy into terrible seizures and finally came out of him. As the boy lay there looking like a corpse, everyone thought he was dead. But Jesus stooped down, gently took his hand and raised him up to his feet. And he stood there completely set free. What an amazing story. I wish they would have interviewed the boy's father after this. I really wish there was an eyewitness account of the boy's father going, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you about the life we lived of hopelessness up until this point. Let me tell you how frustrating it's been dealing with this illness. Let me tell you how tormented our family has been. And in a moment, Jesus changes everything. 
I want to talk to you about three enemies of hope that we see inside of this story. We see at the beginning of a story a hopeless father. He comes to Jesus and just goes, Jesus, I brought him to your disciples. I've tried everything. Imagine those of you that have children loving your child and having this issue and being so frustrated and not being able to fix it or help them and trying everything you can try and ending up at Jesus going, hey, Jesus, I don't know if you can, but if you could, we've tried everything. Maybe you can do something amazing with my child. And then Jesus does what only Jesus could do and blows everyone away. But I want to give you the enemies that this man had to defeat in order for the miracle to happen. Hey, I want you to know, anytime God wants to do a miracle in your life, the enemy loves to put up roadblocks to try and stop it from happening. And we're going to talk about three roadblocks today that the enemy will throw your way in your journey of hope. Number one, if you're taking notes. Number one, past letdowns. Past letdowns. Verse 21, we see the man come to Jesus and it says, Jesus asked the father, Jesus turned to the father and asked him, how long has your son been tormented like this? How long has he been tormented like this? Hey, if someone was to ask you in the darkness of your soul, how long have you been tormented by that? Are there areas, is there relationships, is there frustrations, is there sicknesses, is there disease, is there hopelessness that you've been tormented by? And I think of the boy's father as Jesus says, how long has it been going on like this? Thinking of the memories I think of our child being born and then realizing something's not right and the father trying to control the boy and stop him from hurting himself and stop. Can you imagine the torment of the soul when Jesus asked him a simple question, how long has it been going on like this? I bet you he just was frustrated. I bet you he was exhausted. I can only imagine the father who had tried everything, including bringing him to the disciples who had been doing miracles. And when they couldn't do it, you have to imagine all hope was drained out of his body. All hope out of his soul. Because sometimes it's easier not to have hope than to hope and be let down. Sometimes it's easier to just let our expectations fall so that we don't get let down by God. Maybe you've been there before. Past letdowns will wear you down. I don't understand why God waited until this point to deliver this boy. What I do know is... That in the moment he delivered him, all of a sudden, there was a whole new joy and hope that came into these people's lives. All of a sudden, the years of torment and frustration didn't even matter anymore. They were so joyful that their son had been healed. Jesus, in a moment, does what they were waiting a lifetime for somebody to do. There's something about the sovereignty of God that we must trust. And as I was praying over this and going, Jesus, why that long? Why didn't the disciples cast it out? Why didn't they find another priest or another rabbi that could do Jesus for him what needed to be done? And then I had a moment, I had a thought that if it wasn't Jesus that did it at the time that Jesus did it at, I wouldn't be preaching on this story today. Hey, there is something about the sovereignty of God. You know what the sovereignty of God means? It means we don't always understand why God operates the way he does. But when he does show up and do what only he can do, it's a whole new world. All of a sudden, he has orchestrated things in such a way that it doesn't just benefit us, but it benefits everyone around us. And I have to think that Jesus was waiting for a moment to deliver this boy when people witnessed the goodness of God, when his disciples witnessed the goodness of God, and when he knew someone would take note of this story and write it down so that me and you could learn from it today. There's something about the sovereignty of God. You ever hear the country song? Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. That wasn't that my bad. <laughs> Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. How about that? Is that better? You ever hear that song? I don't know about you, but every single time I hear that song, I thank God for my wife. Because there was a lot of prayers I prayed leading up to her. A lot of God, I think this is the one. I think she's the one. God, I love her so much. Thank God for unanswered prayers. I'm so thankful for the times that I thought I knew what I needed in the moment. God was living so far ahead of me. God's purpose and vision for my life was so much further than what I realized. That only he knew when the right time to bring the right thing into my life was. 
Only he knew what my wife needed to be equipped to handle. <laughs> Come on. Hey, God knows what we need. God knows what we're capable of handling. And God knows the right time to do what only he can do. So if you're praying for a miracle, if you're believing God to do something, if you're like the Father, how long has this been going on? How long have you been tormented by this? I want you to know God is waiting to show up and do something miraculous in your life at a moment that changes everything. Number one, past letdowns. We can get worn out when we're battling the enemy. Having hope a long time is hard. It's hard to continue to hope when you wake up every day and you see no reason to hope. It's hard to continue to, to expect and put our expectations high. Okay, Jesus, now's the time. Only to be let down and frustrated with God. Hey, I want you to know God is sovereign. And I don't understand God's timing. And one day we'll get to heaven and he'll explain it all to us. But I do know that his timing is perfect. I'm praying for you today if that's you. Number two. Number two, doubt. Doubt. Past letdowns will hurt us. Doubt will kill us. Verse 23, Jesus said to him, what do you mean if? Okay, so this is what the father says. The father in verse 22 goes to him and says, if you can heal him, Jesus, please. Okay, we saw his hopelessness. Then Jesus says to him in verse 23, what do you mean if? I love how Jesus, Jesus is just like, what do you mean if? Like Jesus doesn't know he's lived with this illness for a long time. Like he doesn't know his disciples couldn't heal him. What do you mean if? If you were able to believe... All things are possible to the believer. All things are possible to the believer. So the, we have a problem. The problem is doubt. Jesus, if you could do this. Jesus, if you could please help me. Jesus, if. And Jesus responds and says, what do you mean if? So what's the fix? We see the fix right after it. Jesus says to him, if you were able to believe, all things are possible. Now verse 24, when he heard this, the boy's father cried out with tears saying, I do believe, Lord, help my little faith. Hey, what do we do in moments of doubt? We rely on the source of hope. We go to Jesus and we say, God, I need more faith. Jesus, I'm weak, but you are strong. God, I'm at my end, but you are at your beginning. God, when I am my weakest, you are your strongest. We think of the poem, The Footprints in the Sand. Have you ever seen the poem, The Footprints in the Sand? It's silly, and I feel like I see it everywhere. But it's such a good illustration of how our mind works. If you haven't heard the poem of the footprints of the sand, I don't know the poem offhand, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you the synapses. I'll give you the, 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 what's the books we used to use? in The cliff notes. I'll give you the cliff notes. Here's the cliff notes. A man is walking down the beach. He's frustrated with God that he's walking alone. Here's one foot of footprint. There's one set of footprints in the sand. And as he's walking, he's looking and he's frustrated with God that he's having to walk this journey by himself. And finally, he cries out to God and says, God, why are you making me walk this journey by myself? And God responds to him and says, you're confused because you think those footprints are your footprints, but those footprints are my footprints as I carry you. Hey, how many of you know when you are weak, he is strong. When you are at your end, he is at his beginning. Today, if you are low on faith, low on hope, low on joy, low on peace, I encourage you cry out to God and say, God, I need more. I need more. I need more faith. I need more hope. God, I need more joy. I need more peace, God. I need more. The man cries out, Jesus, I need more. And Jesus responds by healing his child. Hey, I want you to know if you're at your end today, it's the perfect day to cry out for more. It's the perfect time to cry out for more hope, more joy, more peace, more faith, more trust in the Holy Spirit who comforts all of us. Hey, today, I encourage you, if you need more, if the doubt is plaguing you, if that's the roadblock in your way, every time you get close to it, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. I want you to know, you can do it. Cry out for more. I'm 30, almost 34 years old, and I've never done a backflip in my life. We got a trampoline, and I'm out there, and when I was a kid, I was always taller than everybody else, so I was so scared to try and do a backflip. I was, when you're tall, you think of doing a backflip, all you think is, I'm going to snap my body in half. Okay, that's all that goes through your mind. Every time you go up, you're like, not today. I'm not snapping my body in half today. I could never do it. I was so scared. The other day, I get out on the trampoline with my kids, and I'm jumping, and one of them oh, had to say, hey, Dad, can you do a backflip? Now, listen, 
All of us want to be Superman to our kids, okay? All of us want to be Superman. All of us want to be their hero. All of us want to be the strongest man they've ever seen. The man who can do anything. But the backflip was an issue. <laughs> and they say, Dad, try a backflip. So I don't want to let them know that I'm still scared at 34 of snapping my six foot four body in half if I do a backflip. So I get on this trampoline and I'm jumping and I'm trying to talk myself into it. I'm remembering all the tips people gave me when I was younger and I would try. Okay, just lean back, tuck your knees to your face, lean back to, I'm in there, I'm jumping, I'm jumping and they're all cheering, come on dad, come on dad, come on dad. Now they don't know that I have no clue how to do a backflip. I have no clue how to do a backflip though. Come on, daddy, you can do it, you can do it. I'm jumping and every jump I'm going, oh, is this high enough? Then I'm going, I get too high. I must land right on my face, right in front of my kid. I'm gonna fly off the trampoline. You start thinking of all the crazy stuff that could happen. I'm jumping, I'm jumping. And all of a sudden, my daughter Finley from the side goes, daddy. And I look at her and she goes, I believe in you. And there's something about when she said, I believe in you, I pulled a backflip that would make an Olympian proud. I just crawl straight back. Then I landed and I said, y'all think that was good? Watch this. Boom, boom, back to back backflips. You think that's good? Watch this. Boom, backflip, front flip. Whoa! I got off of there. They were convinced I was in the Olympics, okay? They were shocked that I could do that. And let me give you something better. I was shocked that I could do that. But there was something about their belief inside of me that encouraged me to remove the roadblock of doubt. Hey, I want you to know, just like we started and Paul said, I'm, I'm praying these things for you. I am praying for you. I believe in you. You can do it. God has plans for you. Whatever the roadblock in your way is, it's small compared to the magnificence of our God. And there is nothing that stands in his way that he can't remove. That's a great time to clap if you're in your living room. Hey, number two, doubt. Number one, past letdowns. We're just worn out. Number two, Doubt. Doubt. Help us believe. Hey, I believe in you. You can do it. Doubt. And then number three, number three, the fear of the what if. The fear of the what if. Verse 23, Jesus says to him, what do you mean if? What do you mean what if? Hey, we all have our what ifs. You know those what ifs. You lay in bed at night and think about them. What if this happens? What if this goes wrong? What if this check doesn't come in? What if this bill goes unpaid? What if she gets sick? What if she dies? What if he's ill? What, what, if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And all these what ifs can run through our mind and cause us to live a life frustrated, confused, scared, anxious. Because what if this happens? What if this happens? You ever meet somebody that's so scared because of the what ifs? I don't get on the highway because what, what if somebody runs me off the road? I don't go out in public because what if, what if I catch it? I don't, I don't do this because what if this goes wrong? I've always had a dream to do this, but what if it doesn't work? What if they don't love me? What if they really did that? What if, what if, what if? But I think it's so interesting how our what ifs are so different than Jesus' what ifs. Why do we have our what ifs? I want to read to you Proverbs 13, 12. Here's what it says. When hope's dreams seem to drag on and on, the delay can be depressing. The delay can be depressing. But when at last your dream comes true, life's sweetness will satisfy your soul. The, the, verse, the version of that verse that you've probably heard is hope deferred makes the heart sick. This is the Passion Translation. It's one of my favorite translations to read out because of how vividly it takes Scripture and presents it to us. The version you've heard of this is hope deferred makes the heart sick. What does it mean? It means when you spend a lot of time going, okay, okay, maybe it's going to happen. Maybe it's going to happen. But what if this happens? And what if this happens? And what if, okay, but maybe it's going to happen. And what if this happens? What if? You end up just making yourself sick. You end up making yourself sick. And when God does show up and does something amazing, it's amazing. But oftentimes we've been so sick of our own doubt and own frustrations that by the time it happens, it's not an amazing event. It's finally just a relief of anxiety and worry. Oh, thank God, okay, everything's fine. Instead of being able to celebrate and rejoice when God does something amazing. How do we combat it? How do we combat it? I love what Jesus says. Jesus looks at the man, he says, if you can heal him. And Jesus goes, if? I tell you, if you believe, 
all things are possible. If you believe, all things are possible. Let me tell you what that means. If Jesus said it, it's true. And Jesus is saying to us, if you can believe, it can happen. If you can trust in me and my sovereignty and my goodness, it can happen. I wonder how many times when I get to heaven, God's going to go, there was so much more for you. But you couldn't believe if this happened. You, you were concerned with the what ifs and the doubt. So you never put the God, if you can do it, I know it's going to be amazing. God, I know you can do it. What if God shows up? We need to switch our what ifs from what if this happens to what if God does what only God can do? What if God shows up and this is amazing? What if God touches my brother, sister, son, daughter, and they have a life-changing moment with him? What if God can do this? Hey, I want to be a person that goes, God, what, what if you show up, God, and, and a thousand people show up on day one? God, what if you show up and the person I've been praying for for so long is set free? God, what if that happens? That would be amazing. What are we doing? We're changing our what ifs from what ifs of doubt to what ifs of hope. We're switching from what ifs of doubt. What if this happens and then I don't know what I'm going to do and what if this happens? What if, to God, what if you show up and do what only you can do? And listen to me, I don't understand it all. I'd be lying if I told you I did. But there is some power that is released when we put our what if in the power of God. I'm telling you, in the process of building this building, there's so many stories I want to share with you. There's so many, and I'm going to share them when we're in the building. But there's been moments that we've hit glitches in this thing. And they've said, hey, we don't know if we can do this. Or we don't know if you're going to be able to afford us to do this. Or if you can't come up with this, then we can't finish this project. And we can't... And all of the what ifs that begin to flow through your mind. And I was laying in bed one day, frustrated, anxious, tormented, the worry, the doubt, the fear of all these things. And in a moment, I decided, I'm not going to be the what if, God, if you could please do this. I'm going to be the what if God shows up and does more than we could ever imagine. I'm laying in bed going, God, I don't know how, I don't know where, I don't know when, but I know who. And I know when you decide to step down to do it, it will be better than I could ever imagine. And hey, let me tell you this. When you set your hope on that, Jesus always shows up and does something more than we could ever expect or imagine. Because he's Jesus. He's Jesus. The man was hoping for a healing for his son. Not only did he get to meet Jesus, not only did Jesus heal his son, but then the man got put in the greatest book to ever be written on the face of the earth. He was hoping for a healing not only did he get a healing, but he got a history book. Not only did he get a healing, but he got a place in the greatest book ever written. Hey, I don't know about you, but I want the better then. I want the God, what if you show up and do something amazing? I want to change my what ifs from what ifs of doubt to what ifs of hope. Can you do that with me today? As I close, I want to talk to you for just a moment about my what ifs. About my fears, my frustrations, my concerns, my worries that I've had. I think sometimes people think when you're a pastor, they're like, oh, because you're a pastor, God just lets you do everything, just worked out fine. And that's amazing for you, Pastor Christian, but you don't know the situation I'm in. When I was in college, and some of you have heard this story, and if you have, just disregard it or listen in again, I'm good with either one. I was in college, and me and Alex were in class, and we were coming back from class, and a lady came up to us and said, um, hey, can I, can I pray for you? I feel like God spoke something to me. Can I pray for you? So she prays for us, and she says a few different things to us. But one of the things she says to us is, God's about to do something in you you never thought he could do. Okay, now the story of me and Alex is, I mean, Alex has been together since she was 16. She, we got married knowing she wasn't going to be able to have children. The doctors had told us she can't have children. She had one of her ovaries removed when she was eight. A tumor had eaten it, and the other one was under attack constantly. So when we got married, the conversation as we started even dating was, I just need you to know I can't have kids. So if you want kids, I, I might not be the one. I did want kids. I'm from a big family. There's six of us. Kids were a dream for me. But I loved Alex and said, you know what? If we got to adopt, we got to adopt. We'll do whatever we got to do. I believe that God's going to do something amazing. So we begin to date, and this happens. This woman comes, she says, God's about to do something you never thought you could do. And she says, tell me about your story. And so we start telling her, and, and Alex goes, you know, I'm not able to have children. And the woman stops her and says, I know you think that, but what God showed me, I saw 
little bare feet running all over your upstairs and you being frustrated and you shouldn't even worry about that. God's going to bless you with more children than you can imagine. And I'm going like, oh, it's an amazing word, but, but all of the doubt begin to attack. But yeah, it's an amazing word, but I don't want to get my hopes up. So if I get my hopes up and it doesn't happen, gosh, you're such a letdown. I can't, I can't take being let down by God. I can't take being depressed. I can't take her being let down again. So I just kind of held it in my heart. We just kind of, you know, we didn't even really talk about it. Oh, that'd be cool. But hey, you know what? This other stuff she said was great. It was uh, about two months later. Alex came to me with a positive pregnancy test. And she's going, look at this. This was it. It happened. It really happened. What the woman said really happened. How crazy is this? We're so excited. We're ecstatic. We're rejoicing. We're praising God. We're calling all our family and friends. We go in for the first ultrasound. We do the surprise for our parents. We're pregnant. All the stuff that you do on your first pregnancy. So excited. And we get in the room where they're going to do the ultrasound and they begin to put the ultrasound on her stomach and her mom's in there and I'm in there and we're excited and, and they begin to find the womb and the uterus and then they find the sac and, and I'm a medic in the Air Force. I just got now, so I understand what's happening. And I'm watching as they begin to search for the heartbeat. And Alex doesn't know yet what I knew immediately. And, and they're searching and, and Alex keeps asking, where, can we listen to the heartbeat? But what she didn't know that I knew was there was no heartbeat. There was, as I looked at the sack, there was no fertilized egg. There was no actual child. There was just, it was an, it was a, it was an egg that had just not come to fruition. And I'm sitting there thinking, God, why would you do this to us? God, why would you do this to us? We got our hopes up. You sent someone to give us a word. They told us we'd have kids and then this happens. And, and God, what, why would you even do this to us? This is why I don't get my hopes up, God. Because I don't understand how you work. I don't get it, God. And it just lets me down and I get frustrated. And, and I can't take another heartbreak like this, God. Walked out of that office that day comforting my wife, trying to be strong. Trying to let her know it's okay. There's still hope. At least there was a chance. Maybe. Maybe it'll happen later. Maybe it'll be, maybe it'll be different than we thought. But, but hey, how cool is this? It was almost there. And only people who've walked that road and know that struggle know the sadness that comes along with that, the heartache that comes along with that. A couple months later, we had moved back home at this point, and I was a college pastor at my dad's church, and Alex walks out one day and, 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 and it hesitantly goes, hey, I, 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 got, I got another positive pregnancy test. And immediately in my mind, I thought, God, not again. Not again, God, don't do this to us again. Please, God, don't do this to us again. Because it's easier sometimes to lower my expectations than to increase my hope and trust in God. And as I sat there going, God, please, not again. We scheduled another appointment. We show up with our moms. And I'm sitting there as they're doing the ultrasound going, God, please, not again. I can't take this again, God. And I'll never forget them doing the ultrasound and putting it on and us seeing Eli's heartbeat and watching him move and realizing it's a healthy baby, it's a whole baby it's a, the, the baby is going to be fine, there's a baby in there and, and I was fresh out of the military so I felt a little you know, it closed off emotionally is a good way to say it and I tell my mother-in-law and my wife and they're excited and my mom and I say hey I'm going to go get the car and I go to get the car and there was a moment in the car between me and God that I'll never forget as long as I live. And it was a moment where in that second I said, God, I don't understand why you did it this way. I don't understand how you work or your timing. I don't, it doesn't make sense to me, God. But what you did in this moment, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And I begin to weep. Not just cry, soul cries, weeps that only God can bottle up in a bottle for us. Tears that the Bible says one day we'll get to heaven and he'll pour, pour out all of our tears. And in a moment, I realized the sovereignty of God, the goodness of God. And the only thing I had to stand on to even walk back into that second appointment was the word that God had given us that he was going to do what our heart's desire had been. Hey, I want you to know there's times in this journey that it doesn't make sense. 
There's times in the journey that the roadblocks are there and it's frustrating and it seems overwhelming and hopeless and depressing. There's times that you don't know what are going to happen and it's really scary. But if I can tell you one thing about the Word of God and the goodness of God is that He always, always, always comes through. God is always faithful to His Word. He is always faithful to His promises. And we don't understand the timing of them, but just like Jesus looked at Him and said, what if, if you can believe it can be done? Hey, I want to encourage you today. If you're hopeless, if you're, if you're, if you're covered in doubt and worry and anxiety, I want to speak to you what Jesus said. If you can believe, if you can believe, if you can find a seed, if you can find the Word of God to stand on, it doesn't have to be great, it can be a small word. If you can find a word to stand on and trust in the promises of God, God will do what only God can do. And when He does it, just like Paul told us at the beginning, it becomes a testimony, not just to our lives, but we become a walking advertisement for the promises and the faithfulness of God. Hey, I want you to know today, your miracle is on the way. If you can believe, if you can trust, if you can hope, if you can remove the doubt, if you can remove the torment, if you can get over how long it's been, being just worn out by these things, it's right around the corner. Aren't you so glad this man didn't give up with his son when the disciples prayed for him and said, sorry, we can't do anything? He could have walked away. He could have said, well, then come on, son. Come on, let's just... Let's just just go back to life like it was, son. Just go back to the way things have always been. Aren't you glad that he said, hey, let's try one more time. Let's try one more time. Let's go to one more man. This person, they say, can do anything. Hey, I want you to know today, it's the same person that can do anything for you today that did anything for them that day. It's the same God. It's the same Jesus. It's the same Spirit of God that is waiting to work on your behalf. Let's remove the roadblocks. Let's try one more time. Let's push into the hope that God has for us. Let's be expectant that God's going to do something amazing. I was having this discussion with some men this week. I talked about the power of expectation. The power of what it means to God when we just expect Him to show up. And I used the example of Eli. Sometimes Eli leaves his lunch when he goes to school, when he went to school, and all the parents that are waiting for school to come back said, amen. And Eli would leave his lunch, and he'd say to me before I got on the bus, Dad, I don't want my lunch. And I would say, hey, don't worry, I'll bring you lunch. All of a sudden, whatever my day was planned was totally switched because I knew Eli was expecting me to bring him lunch. I moved meetings around. I'm calling people, hey, can y'all drop off lunch? Can, can someone do this so I can go drop off lunch for him? Because you know what I knew? I know he's sitting in his desk going, Dad's bringing me something. Dad's bringing me lunch. Dad's bringing me lunch. And you know what's amazing about when he expects Dad to show up? Is that Dad doesn't show up with the ham sandwich, peanut butter, and jelly that Mom had packed in the morning. Dad shows up with McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, Sonic, anything that I know that he loves. That's what I'm showing up with. He knows that I'm showing up with it. And because I know that he's expecting it, it's on my mind all the time. Hey, I want you to know, when you trust in God and expect God to show up, there is a power of expectancy that happens where God now is going, oh, they know I'm the only one that can work in their situation. Oh, they're waiting for me to show up. Oh, they're believing that I'm going to show up. They're telling people I'm going to show up. And you know what happens when God shows up? He always shows up with Chick-fil-A. He always shows up with something better than what we expected. He always shows up with something miraculous. He always shows up and however it happens, you're so thankful you left the peanut butter jelly sandwich at home and got whatever God brought. Hey, today, we can make that decision. Maybe it's a job loss that happened in this thing. Maybe it's a sickness that you're battling through. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's isolation, loneliness. But if you can put some hope, if you can have a heart of expectancy, if you can remove the barriers that try and stand in our way, then God can do something miraculous. Would you bow your heads with me today? God, today we're so thankful. We're so thankful for your heart for us. That you see the struggles, God. 
You knew your word says on this earth there will be trouble. God, you knew the trouble we would encounter. You knew the doubt we would encounter. You knew the hopelessness we would encounter at times. But God, you also knew what you're capable of. And you also knew that when we join with you, anything can happen. When our expectancy is set on you, God, anything can happen. Today, God, I ask that you would release a spirit of hope and expectancy on each and every person watching this. God, I pray that you would do inside of them what only you could do. That they would find a word from you, a verse from you. And they would cling to it, God. And they would hold on to it until you show up and do what only you can do. God, today we remove the barriers. We're not going to doubt. We're not going to throw our what-ifs out there. We're not going to get worn out. God, we're going to press in. We have need of endurance, like your word says, so that when we have finished the race, we will receive the reward. God, I ask for endurance for our people. I ask for hope for our people. I ask for our what-ifs to change from what-ifs of doubt to what if God's got something amazing for me. And God, I pray as we walk in that, that you show up and do what only you can do. With every head bowed and every eye closed, there may be some of you out here, maybe your struggle is the struggle me and Alex had. And I just want to take a moment, I don't do this often, but there's a few things that, that God has gifted me with. I don't understand it. All I know is when I pray for people and they can't get pregnant, God does something amazing. We're on person number 11 that couldn't get pregnant that I prayed for. And within like a month or two months, they got pregnant. I don't understand it. It's not me. It's God. But I do know that if it's a gift, I don't want to squander it. And I want to help out whoever I can help out. So if that's you today, maybe you're sitting in your house. Maybe that's been your struggle. Maybe that's been your heart cry. Hey, I want you to know, I understand. I know the feeling. It's not a foreign feeling to me. We've been through it several times. And it is frustrating, and it is heartbreaking, and it is discouraging. But there is hope. There is hope. I now have three beautiful children. And every time I get fed up with them, every time they make messes and do something crazy, my wife walked in the other day, and she was so frustrated with the kids. It was just one of those days. And she walked in, and she looked at me and just said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm about to lose my mind. And I looked at her and I said, baby, Remember when we didn't think we could have kids? Remember when we thought there was no chance we would have little barefoot running around our upstairs and making noise? Hey, on our worst day, I'm so grateful for what God has done for us. If that's you today, I just want to pray for you. I'm not promising you anything. I don't know how God works all the time. But I do know that I just want to pray for you and believe with you that God's going to do what you've been hoping for him to do. If that's you, would you just take your spouse's hand and just, just set your hands like this? I just want to pray over you. God, right now you see each and every person out there. You see the desires of their heart. God, you see the tears they've cried in their bed at night. You see the moments of despair and darkness. You see the journey they've walked. God, right now I pray that you would do what only you can do. God, I pray a supernatural miracle would happen inside of each and every person who has that desire in their heart. God, that they would set their what ifs on what if God shows up and actually does what he said he could do. Today, God, I pray that you would bless them. I pray, God, that there would be a spirit of fruitfulness on their womb. God, I pray that every lie of the enemy that's in their heart and mind would be removed. And that they would see you show up and do something amazing. God, do what only you can do, I pray. Now, there's those of you that are watching this that maybe you're thinking, Christian, this all sounds great. But I've never even taken that first step of having a relationship with God. I've experienced church or I've experienced religion, but I've never experienced the relationship with my Heavenly Father. Today, I want to give you that opportunity to do that. If that's you, would you just repeat this prayer after me? You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your heart. You can say it under your breath. As long as you mean it is what I ask. Dear Lord Jesus, today, I recognize my need for you. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you came from heaven to earth to live a perfect life. And Jesus, I believe you died a death on the cross that I deserved. But you did it, you did it to pay my sin bill so that I wouldn't have to. Today, Jesus, I accept that gift. I believe, Jesus, on the third day that you rose from the dead to give me new life, hope, and freedom all the days of my life. Today, Jesus, I choose you. 
I choose to love you, to serve you, and to worship you. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Hey, I am so proud of you if you made that decision for the first time. If you want more information on that journey, if you're looking for some next steps and how you can get plugged in and continue that road with Jesus, would you reach out to us? You can email me at christian at valleyrisechurch.com. You can send us a DM on any of our social media platforms. We want to connect with you and see God do something amazing in your life. It's the best decision you'll ever make. Hey, couples, if that was you that I prayed for, please let me know if God does something amazing in your life. I want to celebrate with you. I do know that journey, and I know the joy of the other side. So I'm here telling you today, let's keep believing. What if God shows up and does something amazing? I can't wait to hear the stories of God's faithfulness. Hey, none of this happens without you guys. We're so thankful for each and every person who calls Valley Rise home. We couldn't continue to run Valley Rise without your faithfulness and your tithes and offerings. And thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. We are a most generous church that I know. You guys are so awesome. And I promise when you give to God through Valley Rise, we do everything we can to steward that and use it in the best way possible. Hey, if you can't prepare to worship your tithes and offerings, you can go ahead and prepare that. Like we always say at Valley Rise, I will never ask you for anything. The Bible says every man should decide in his own heart what the Lord would have him give. So what we say at Valley Rise is you pray, and whatever God tells you to do, that's what we want you to do. We trust in God's faithfulness. Hey, um, there's three ways that you can give. You can text Valley Rise in the amount to 77296. You can go to valleyrisechurch.com, click the giving link, or you can send a check to the mailing address on the screen. We're so thankful for each and every one of you who call Valley Rise home to continue to invest and sow into this, this building that's going to change lives. I was praying in here today. I came in here earlier. I was just spending an hour in here praying and walking around. I had a thought when I was in the kids' classrooms. Think about the kids' lives that are going to come here. The people that are going to be brought with a friend. And their life's going to be changed forever because of what they encounter at Valley Rise Church. Their family's going to be different. They're going to raise children differently. Hey, I want to be a part of that. That's a legacy I want to leave. So I'm so thankful for each and every one of you who invest into that and help leave that legacy as well. It's not my legacy. It's your legacy, Valley Rise Church. I just simply get to be the person that's in charge. That's the gift that God gave me, but I couldn't do any of it without you. I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. We're going to pray over this and I'll let you get out of here. Dear God, thank you so much for each and every gift and every giver. God, thank you for the body of Valley Rise Church. God, thank you for those who continue to pour back in to what has been a blessing to them. God, I ask that your hand would be upon them. I pray that you would return it to them a hundredfold. God, you know what people need. You know the provision they need. You know the resource they need. God, I pray that you would pour it back to them a hundredfold. That as we step out and trust you, God, your word is always faithful. And you said when we give, you are faithful to return, God. So we claim that promise. We give to you, God, and we ask that you would return it like never before. That they would, you would bless their lives, God. Your favor would be upon them. Let them walk in your favor. Give them favor with you and favor with man. May everything they set their hands to, seeking first the kingdom of God, flourish and thrive and prosper. God, bless them in their going out and their coming in again. I pray for healing on those that are sick. I pray for hope on those that are low, God. I pray joy on those that are struggling. God, we pray, what if God things this week? Bless our people. Bless this day, I pray. In Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Hey, Valley Rise Church, I love you, and I can't wait to see you right back here next Sunday at 10 a.m.